Hello everyone. The topic of today's seminar is an accuracy study to advance patient uh, center measurement method for team-based care. And our speaker is Dr. Francis Lau. Dr. Francis is a professor in the School of Health Information Science at the University of Victoria. He is a PhD graduate in applied science in, in medicine from the University of Alberta with specialized specialization in medical informatics. He has a diverse background in business, computing, and medical science with 14 years of professional experience in IT industry. He has led a number of large-scale uh, CHR FANA initiatives, including the Health Informatics Research Training Program, New Emerging uh, Team Imperative, and End of Life Care, and partnership in health system improvement. He was also the recipient of, of the eHealth Chair FANA by CHR, uh, in 2008 to 2013 to establish an eHealth Observatory to monitor the impact of health information system development in Canada. Let's see, uh, our classmate Raj will share information about other fancy research interests and current research topic related to health informatics. Thank you. So Dr. Lau's uh, three research areas are social in terms of health in the EHR, health information systems, in terms of research and evaluation methods and health information standards, especially around the reference standards from SCP. Dr. Lau is one of the few researchers that have looked at aspects of SNOMED CT in terms of usage and impact. Now, looking at Google Scholar, Dr. Lau has been cited over 7,900 times. Most cited paper was in 1999 with over 2,000 citations around action research that combined theory and practice through self-reflection and agreeable uh, ethical framework. Uh, Dr. Lau has also been involved in creating an e-health observatory that focuses on research of areas around EMR, uh, patient care prescribing, or especially with e-drugs and patient health portal evaluations as some of the topic areas. His current research is focused on more social determinants of health topics like gender and waste capture in digital health systems, using, using patient-centered measurements of primary care in a project that I am currently privileged to be attached to, improving problem lists in the EHR. Thank you, Dr. Lam. Thank you for that uh, introduction. It shows you how old I am. <laughs> That's why I'm retiring. So anyway, um, thank you so much for taking the time to attend this seminar. Today, I'm presenting this work really on behalf of our research team, whose names are listed here. And I believe some of them are actually here, uh, virtually, that is. So we completed this field study last year during the height of the COVID pandemic. It was indeed a challenging time to do research. You may recall the uh, during the pandemic, all the field research in BC and pretty much the rest of Canada were suspended for several months. And even when we resumed the study later, the healthcare system continued to be overwhelmed. So uh, last thing that people think about is research. So it was with a great deal of uh, patience, persistence, creativity, and the help from healthcare providers, patients, advocates, and the vendor, uh, that we were able to carry out and complete this particular study. So this is what, uh, what I'm going to share with you today. So here's the agenda. Um, the PCM stands for patient-centered measurements. So I'll first provide a little bit about the study context. I'm going to talk a little bit about the participatory design process that we used uh, to conduct this study, and also the uh, emergent portal-based intervention. So basically, we, we created a bunch of intervention flipped around the patient portal. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And more importantly, the proposed uh, PCM methods that we uh, conceptualized for team-based care. And of course, I'll, I'll wrap up with next steps and also in terms of providing some selected references. So here are five points I'm going to talk about in this particular uh, presentation. Uh, the first one is, uh, what is patient-centered measurement, well, or PCM? So PCM is a, a key part of patient-centered care, where one's values and uh, perspectives are recognized and prioritized in their care. PCM include the uh, PROMS, which is the uh, patient-reported outcome measures, and also PREMS, which is the uh, patient-reported exp uh, patient experience measures. And then uh, it's since been extended to include also the all kinds of patient-generated health data such as heart rates, uh, blood pressures, and dietary intakes, et cetera. So what are the BC support unit uh, methods cluster? 
An ABC support unit, it's actually an acronym, stands for British Columbia Support for People and Patient Oriented Research and Trials Unit, which is part of a national program in Canada to help uh, healthcare research become more relevant and meaningful to patients. Within BC, the BC Support Unit is a multi partner organization created to support, streamline, and increase patient oriented research throughout BC. The um, Methods Clusters or an initiative in BC that brought together all of the people involved in care. They include patients, researchers, healthcare providers, and decision makers uh, to take on research projects to improve our understanding of the best way to do patient-oriented research. And um, in BC, this uh, methods uh, clusters actually consists of six different clusters, each one with a different focus. The uh, cluster that funded our research is called the Patient Center Measurement Methods Cluster. And that cluster is co led by uh, Rick Sawatsky, who is a professor in Canada Research Chair from the Nursing School at Trinity Western University, and also Lena Cupertson, who is an executive director of the uh, Provincial Office of PCM and Improvement at the BC Ministry of Health. And the aim of the PC Methods Cluster is to understand what matters most to patients by collecting information on their experiences and outcomes. And in 2019, the cluster invited people to submit project proposals to conduct PCM studies um, in one of the 11 themes. And on the website here, you see the 11 uh, themes listed, you know, which include uh, measurement that is patient-driven, ensuring patients feel safe to provide feedback, methods for enhancing representation of marginalized, vulnerable, or hard-to-reach population, and so on and so forth. And what we did was that we submitted as a team a proposal for to address two of the themes, uh, which are to develop and implement innovative technologies for PCM, and also integrating patient-reported data with clinical and administrative data. At least that's what we were hoping to do at the beginning. So you'll tell later on that um, uh, we didn't achieve all of what we wanted to do, to do but some. So I'll, I'll briefly describe our conceptual framework and the study flow. And um, can't see the top here. Oh, I can't see the top because I got that far. It's a conceptual uh, study framework. You got to notice that in BC, there are many players, many stakeholders in terms of um, uh, dealing with uh, primary care in particular. There's the Doctors of BC, which is a volunteer organization uh, involved with um, uh, medical doctors and trainees in BC, providing an advocacy, service, and support role for doctors. And then we have the health authorities in the middle over here uh, that are responsible for uh, delivering health services to all BC residents. And we have the Ministry of Health uh, with the overall responsibility of ensuring health services are available for all BC residents. Uh, then there's the uh, General Practice Service uh, Committee, GPSC, uh, which is a joint committee between BC government and doctors of BC, <coughs> working on behalf of BC doctors to find ways to strengthen full service family practice and patient care in BC. And there are two other stakeholders. Uh, uh, the uh, family doctors are general practitioners uh, with their offices and clinics, and then also the community at large, which include patients, family members, and patient partners, and other kind of agencies that deal with um, providing uh, social support, care, etc. Now, the provincial initiatives coordinated by GPSC that are relevant to this particular study are there's a division of family practice in BC. That it's a community-based group of family doctors working with community and health care partners to enhance local patient care and, and to improve professional satisfaction to doctors. Uh, right now, there are 35 such divisions across BC. Then there's a practice support program, uh, which is a service that offers the clinical and practice management support, coaching and mentoring and data tools to the doctors. And the data tools in particular include those for panel management, which we'll talk a little bit more about later on, and patient experience tools, which relate to the PRAMs, and patient medical home or PMH assessment and EMR, or electronic medical record optimization. Then there's the primary care network, which you, I'm sure you have all heard about, especially when you're BC. 
Uh, mm -hmm. There are clinical networks of providers in geographic area where patients receive expanded comprehensive care and improved access to primary care. And there's all, uh, on the right side, there's the uh, team-based care, which is part of the patient medical home model, where health professionals work as interdisciplinary team to provide primary care services to the local population. And in particular, panel management down here is a process of proactively managing defined population of patients, such as diabetic patients um, or patients with uh, mental health issues, using EMR data in particular to identify and respond to patients' chronic and preventive care needs. So initially, we planned two PCM methods. Uh, in the blue box area, that's method one. It was on team-based care and clinic performance based on the patient experience data, such as the, um, you, can, you can hardly see the fine prints down here, but it's the patient experience survey. That's the one that's being used in, in the, uh, one of the regions in BC. And then there's also the, um, the PAM 13, which is the uh, patient activation measure. It's a fairly uh, common tool. So the idea was to um, make use of the, uh, the, these instruments to try to look at um, managing patient experience and clinic performance, as I said. Then method two, um, we wanted to uh, uh, look at creating interventions that would help uh, manage the patient outcome. And there's also the patient health related data uh, that we wanted to capture as well. And um, what we did was that we wanted to package all these interventions somehow into a resource package. And it, it will be a web-based online resource package. And also the, we wanted to conduct a study using the integrated KT or knowledge translation, IKT, with direct stakeholder involvement as study partners all throughout the study. So it's fairly, fairly uh, complex. So, the uh, study flow diagram shows the steps that we went through uh, to conduct the study from start to finish. So in terms of the preparation, there is the uh, uh, first thing that we did after we got the grants approved was how we had to confirm the teams because there's a time lag between when we apply for the grant and when we actually get approved, we have to actually get started. And so we actually have to confirm that the people are still interested in doing that. And also in terms of looking at our priorities because uh, BC have their own sort of priorities with respect to primary health care, and then the different divisions and different clinics, they have their own priorities as well. So we actually uh, need to uh, identify the priorities, and then we then develop a study protocol. We obtain the ethics approval, and then also complete training, because there are some of the patient-centered measurement tools that uh, not everyone is familiar with, and some of the, uh, the patient portal features uh, people are not familiar with as well which I'll talk a little bit more about later on. So there's a um, uh, PCM mapping method one uh, to do with the patient experience data and also the uh, PAM, patient activation, PAM, and team, uh, in terms of looking at team-based care. So what we did was uh, we mapped the care team process and workflow. We actually mapped the practice improvement process. We created use cases, we validated the use cases, and then we also explored technology options. So it's not just a, a one patient portal because there's EMR and there's all kinds of different technology options, especially with um, uh, the pandemic, we had to move to virtual care almost overnight. So we had to sort of do a lot of um, uh, sort of exploration and then we refined the method one. And for method two, having to do with the patient health related and outcome data and panel management. Again, we map the care team process and workflow and we also map the panel management process. Again, we created use cases, validated them, also explored technology options, and also refined the method two as we go along. And as you see later on, uh, we didn't end up with just two methods. In fact, we ended up with a few more in, in, in different ways. So it was very much um, evolving and emerged as we went along with the study. And then of course we packaged it, we packaged, uh, we assembled and test and finalized the resource package. And then um, in terms of wrap up, uh, in, uh, at the end of the study, we communicated the findings and then throughout, we had to coordinate the uh, study because we're actually doing it remotely. So we have to conduct 
on ongoing knowledge translation because again we wanted to involve all the stakeholders and keeping them informed and getting their input and in fact um, getting advice from them in terms of how to proceed with the study and what to do etc throughout the whole study and then there's training and team advisory group meetings so it was a, a lot of processes involved oh by the way the methods that we use a whole bunch of Disability inspection, interview, survey, observation, document review, and also reflection methods to be used as appropriate. So it's very much a mixed uh, study. So in terms of the participatory design process, um, first in terms of the study design, as I mentioned earlier, this is a multi-method study. It was participatory because of we're getting people involved, the stakeholders all involved and engaged. It's iterative because we didn't really know uh, ahead of time how that's going to unfold, especially with the pandemic. We didn't really know week to week whether we're still going to have a clinic next week because um, we actually had to search around for different clinics. And um, I'll explain a little bit more about that as well. Uh, and the study was very much exploratory. And um, if you look at the team, the team that we had included the researchers. We also had patient partners. And then we had the Division of Family Practice. And we had industry partner involved. And by the way, the, the actual study site was in a, a rural clinic in Interior BC. With respect to participants, like I said, it's a rural clinic. And it's a small study. As you can see, we have two docs, two medical office assistants, one nurse, one social worker, four patients, and two quality improvement analysts from the division helping us. And the domain, after uh, sort of a looking through the BC priorities and looking through the um, regional priorities within the interior region, and also looking at the division priorities and looking at the clinic priorities, we settled on mental health. It was either mental health or addiction, and then there was also uh, pregnancy as well. Uh, but we settled on mental health because um, um, that's an area that we have uh, some uh, experience with, in particular looking at anxiety and depression. And the interactions, like I said, uh, they were mostly virtual. Uh, it consisted of emails, telephone calls, Zoom meetings, and working with the standalone patient portal. And the data, different types of data included documents, team mapping. So we went through a team mapping exercise. And there's some outputs there. And there's also these uh, simulated personas. And we had interviews, so we had interview notes. And then we had workflows, workflow diagrams, et cetera. And then, of course, we have the uh, patient portal. <laughs> the analysis consists of a creation of a, a code book. Uh, I mean, that's very typical of qualitative research where you actually uh, provide a scheme in terms of organizing the way that you want to look at your data. And then we did something called the systematic text condensation. It's similar to thematic analysis because we have so many different kinds of data. We really need to look across all the different kinds of information that we have and try to make sense of them, to try to condense them, try to see if they apply, uh, try to see if they make sense the way that we uh, did the uh, condensation. Uh, again, using the code book as a guide and then iterating and repeating and revising as we go. And we also went through a, a intellectual exercise, if you call it, conceptualization, <laughs> because we really want to conceptualize how we go about uh, creating new team-based uh, uh, patient-centered measurement methods. Keep in mind, the methods is not the traditional kind of method that one think of the, you know, there are 10 steps that you actually do the measurements in a certain way and then you get results. It's a little bit more holistic in the sense that we want to conceptualize it all the way uh, around it, a process in terms of from beginning to end. So it's end to end, looking at all different angles in terms of how do we actually, can, uh, how do people conceive patient-centered measurement methods? And how do we go about thinking about it, collecting the information, how do we go about analyzing it? How do we actually convey to people, patients and providers uh, included? So it, it, that, that's why we uh, chose the term conceptualization because it's a lot, lot more uh, uh, creative uh, in that sense. So these are some of the outputs that we created in the end. So they in, involve team mapping, patient personas, PCM questions, actual questions that we had to ask around patient centered measurement uh, methods. And also uh, the mapping summary, so we created some summary about that, and also in terms of workflow diagrams. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these uh, outputs. First is the virtual team mapping. I don't know what you guys have done uh, team mapping before. 
and especially tr trying to do a virtual team mapping, it's, it's actually kind of challenging in that we, um, we engage the uh, participants in a two hour session. It's actually a Zoom session where we actually um, uh, created, uh, we actually had a camera showing this particular diagram. So everybody's looking at the diagram in a Zoom meeting and then trying to discuss uh, what happens in terms of um, looking at PCM. So we want to look at uh, different aspects. We want to look at the roles. We want to look at the tasks. We want to look at the team and or the tools and also anything that's new, new tasks linked to PCM. So we're trying to identify the fact that we move to team-based care and the fact that we're actually using um, patient-centered measurement methods, how that's going to affect the way people uh, conduct their tasks, are their role going to change, are there going to be uh, new tools, uh, so, um, what do team members need to uh, think of, and what are the new tasks in particular to do with the PCM. And then uh, we want to also identify some gaps. So in terms of the simulated patient persona, so here's uh, the actual uh, persona case with Megan, and uh, it's all made up. But, but, um, it, it's um, a case uh, involving Megan as a 32-year-old female who works in construction and was working on getting a carpentry ticket and recently moved to the region for general construction work, staying in the basement apartment with a partner who's working, but not at the moment. So Megan's main health issue is depression. She's taking medication and she recently became part of your clinic. So this is the question that we sort of laid a scenario for the clinic staff who were all at this uh, virtual mapping session. So there are different scenarios that we want to present to the clinic. So scenario A, Megan came in for her first appointment at the clinic. So Megan is now out of her medications and needs a renewal. And her mood seemed to be stable and there are no red flags. So some of the questions that came about with um, Megan then, well, who, who would see her for the first appointment? Uh, what care do we provide? And what do you currently, how do you currently assess for depression? So these are the typical questions uh, that um, would be uh, raised to the clinic. And by the way, uh, as you can see, we try to prompt the questions as well because a uh, 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 patient health questionnaire, uh, PHQ-9 is one of the questionnaires that we use for screening depression. Then another scenario would be that uh, the plan is for Megan to return in three months for a follow-up. Her mood is stable and she follows up as planned and uh, she's adhering to treatment. Well, the question then would be, well, who would she see in the follow-up? How would you screen for depression? Again, do you use PHQ-9 or something else? Well, how would you assess her experience of care at the clinic? So this has to do with the patient experience aspect. And then C, scenario C would be that now Megan does not follow up for a while. She's two months overdue for uh, meds. How would you even know to follow up with Megan? And if you know you need to follow up with Megan, how would you follow up with Megan? And the last scenario here would be that Megan follows up uh, three months overdue and it turns out that she has been in crisis. Her boyfriend suddenly left town, triggering a depression. She lost her jobs two months ago. So well, again, who would see Megan? How would you assess Megan's mood? And how would you communicate across her team? Because if we're talking about team-based care, where there's more than one provider looking after Megan, how do we ensure everybody on the team is on the same page, knowing about what's happening with Megan? So that's really just uh, in terms of uh, managing uh, this uh, patient's uh, depression condition. More specifically to do with the uh, patient-centered measurement questions. There are those that are um, in the um, office and the tools that you may use would be for managing depression and mood. What tools would be most useful for you in assessing Megan's mood when she's in for an appointment? How would you see this being used? So again, the questions are being posed to the clinic staff as they're gathering around doing the virtual mapping to try to prompt them to to discuss that. And in terms of patient experience of care, how would you assess patient experience of care when she's in the office? And then in between visits, well, how would you like to monitor mood on an ongoing basis outside the office and in between visits? Who would review results and how would they be shared with the rest of the team? And would the results be accessible electronically? How often? And what would you do with the results? Again, we prompt it with, uh, do you use any recalls? With respect to the patient experience, 
how would you like to assess Megan's overall experience of care at the clinic? And when would you do this? Is this best done overall for the clinic or should it be done individually? And who would review the results and what would you want to know so you can make improvement? Do you want to know everything? And even if you collect all the information, are you going to be able to do anything with it? So these are all the questions that uh, one needs to think about uh, when you're introducing uh, the uh, patient-centered measurements. In terms of the team mapping summary, uh, we created this uh, mapping summary report. So uh, through that exercise, we identified uh, the roles, which are the blue ones, and then the uh, orange are the tasks, and then there's a, a light yellow, that would be the team or tool, and then the new task linked to the PCM, patient center measurement, will be sort of gray. You won't be able to read the fine print, but the basically, I'll just try out for one or two. If you look at the uh, general practitioner, it's really the meet and greet, taking history, document active issues, update the chart, screen and assess mood depression, refill prescriptions, etc. And then for the social worker on the left side, it's to navigate unemployment support, counseling, safety planning. And for the MOA, it's really about booking appointment with the GP, requesting to transfer records form, and educate the patients about the social work and resources, and to book follow-up, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you look at Megan, Megan need to make follow-up appointments and need to seek care uh, urgently if needed. And with respect to the new task linked to PCM for Megan, Maybe I need to complete the PHQ-9 questionnaire, either at home or somewhere else, or at the clinic. And she needs to understand the limits of the app at home. If she's doing uh, using technology at home, she needs to understand the limits of that. And also in terms of um, uh, the RN, just one more. Uh, the RN, uh, the new task would be triage urgent appointments. And in terms of those that are related to PCM would be to follow up the app results. The app here, we're really talking about uh, maybe a, a patient photo or even a smartphone or something like that. And then escalate based on the results uh, review to the uh, general practitioner or social worker. So really just keeping track of the situation and knowing what to do. Um, and then the, the one last one there is MHSU is the mental health support unit if needed. So. Uh, the inner circle really has to do with the patient's uh, care team, the team-based care uh, members. And then the larger one would be the circle of care uh, because it also can be involving some external um, uh, groups such as the mental health support unit. And yeah, the gaps that we identified for well, there are many. Uh, currently, I'm just going to read off some. Currently, there's no way of tracking this refill, even just basic refill. There's no way to follow up that. And then um, um, the second one would be need for something that provides more longitudinal data or change over time uh, than just the PHQ-9. And then um, the clinic didn't have uh, any video call set up. And so it's, it's really minimal technology. And the bottom one, challenge of increasing uh, motivation, putting too many expectations on the patient. I mean, it's sure it's fine to talk about patient centered measurements and you know patient engagement and um, and all that, but sometimes it can be too much demand on the, and expectations on the patient. And how to help a lot of people enough rather than few people complete. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a, it's a trade off because there's limited time and resources. I won't read the rest. Um, I'm assuming you you'll get the slide deck later on so you can take a look at it on your own. So in terms of the workflow, because we also work with the workflow. Um, so there, there are different parts. The first part is in, in terms of uh, initializing the appointment. So the, if you look at the different people involved, there's a staff, patient, uh, clinician, one, two, and three being you know, the GP, the social worker, and the nurse. And the staff would need to, first of all, book the appointment and schedule the appointment with the patient. The patient then uh, would need to attend, right? So the clinician here would be notified of the upcoming appointment. And then the second one, pre-visit. Pre-visit, actually there are different things happening at pre-visit because there's the, um, the actual uh, PROM, patient reported outcome measures. In this case, uh, it will be the, um, uh, the uh, PHQ-9. So we need to actually uh, pre prepare it and get it entered uh, into the um, uh, 
portal and then into the EMR. The patient will actually receive an invitation to complete the problem, receive the reminder to complete the outstanding problem if the patient hasn't done so in time, and also complete the problem in portal, and then it gets entered into the uh, uh, electronic medical record some uh, later on. And then the clinician then, uh, during the pre-visit, will actually schedule the reminder in the portal, deploy the problem in the portal, and then transfer the problems go to EMR. Now this is because we didn't really have a totally integrated seamless uh, portal to EMR. So we really, really had to sort of simulate um, the actual integration. And um, then there's the review of the problem score and trends in EMR, and then to evaluate whether to flag for significant scores or changes, and then also to discuss the problem score that's even before the, the visit. After the visit, uh, sorry, at the appointment, then there's the, um, the potential in terms of opening up the PCM in the portal at the beginning of the visit by the patient, if so choose. And then the clinician then will use the prompt to guide the care visit discussion, and then maybe review the score and trends in the EMR and discuss the action. Now, I have to uh, mention that this is sort of a mixture of actual or uh, intended, okay? because not all of these steps are happening at all the time. Right? And the fact that I mentioned our, our uh, portal is not um, integrated with the uh, EMR is because at the time, um, the, there are different uh, portals are being implemented in, in the region. The Interior Health Region has its own portal. Division of Family Practice have been encouraging the clinics to implement uh, different portals. There are two of them at the time were being considered. And um, some clinics already have their own portal. So it was very diff difficult and challenging to sort of you know, get in there into the game to try and say, oh, well, can you accommodate us because we're conducting a study? So we actually had to back off, and that's why we actually had to settle for a um, standalone portal. Not ideal, but at least it allowed us to conduct the study, okay? And then the post-visit then, um, the, there's the uh, scheduling the visit with the patient, and then, of course, you know, discussing the actual um, action that will be needed, updating the medications that need, as needed, and also deploy the PREM in the portal if we're talking about the uh, experience measures, and then also schedule the regular delivery of uh, PROM and refer to local community resources as needed. Okay, so, so there are different activities happening over time. So it's, it's very much longitudinal uh, bits and pieces at the time involving different technologies. So here's the, are the emerging uh, emergent portal based interventions. First of all, as I indicated, there's a standalone portal with online resources and PCM tools. So, this particular portal is a commercial product, it's a new product, and it's, it's um, not your usual patient portal per se. It's got some different features. It's also got the ability to actually provide online resources. So, you can actually attach articles, um, peer review articles, reports, papers, or links pointing. Uh, the user to these um, different resources. So that's pretty good because if you want the patients to be able to look at uh, information on their own uh, to uh, sort of initiate self-care, well, one thing is to, for them to be able to know what's out there. And then there's um, the, uh, also the PCM tools, which are your um, M13, your PES, or patient experience survey, and also the uh, we use GAD, which is, I'm, I'm going to talk about that next. In fact, here it is. Uh, there are two interfaces uh, with this particular portal. One has to uh, be used by the patient. One is for uh, the actual providers. And then, as I indicated, you can actually attach articles and questionnaires, reminders, and you can even draw graphs. The resources, uh, the articles, uh, they include the uh, BC Ministry of Health and the uh, Canadian Mental Health Association materials, such as the Bound Back program, for depression and also learning about the P PHQ-9, the patient health uh, questionnaire nine, nine questions, and the PCM tools. So we actually use multiple tools, depression self-action plan, the PHQ-9, general anxiety disorder tool, GAT-7, promised self-confidence questions, uh, and also a subset of the patient experience survey has questions used in the region. 
keep in mind, the province actually used another um, patient experience survey. So there are lots and lots of um, tools and, and resources available. You don't have to be careful how you actually uh, try to put them together. So like I said, we have this simulated photo, uh, EMR integration by the provider. So we actually thought about, well, we can't just have a, um, a standalone uh, portal. So what we did was we uh, actually got the provider to agree to act as the human integrator. So the provider actually would regularly uh, take the information, transfer the PCM data into the EMR in three forms. There's a PDF uh, in the EMR within the PCM section of the EMR, and also with a score within the encounter notes. Because when you think about it, if you're talking about integrating um, uh, sort of uh, patient centered measurements or portal data into EMR, you're really just doing the same kind of thing. You, you actually have to integrate them in several ways. PDF is one way, uh, putting it in, in different sections of the EMR is another way. PCM score within the encounter node, it's a common way. So we're, we're in fact simulating how the PCM data would have been integrated if there is the uh, seamless integration available. And it worked out uh, pretty good. And there's scheduled reminders bi-weekly to review the PCM scores and send um, articles to the patients uh, and questionnaires to the patients. So we actually try to keep that activity uh, ongoing every two weeks. And we also have a portal usage log that um, the portal itself generated that we can use to look at the activity that were done uh, with the portals to see what the people logged in and what they looked at, et cetera. So here's uh, what we uh, proposed uh, at the end of the study. We proposed, uh, in fact, six PCM methods for team-based care. The first one is what we call the team, PCM team mapping. Second one is what we call the longitudinal care alignment. And the third one is digital tool exploration. Fourth one is team-based quality improvement. And another one is shared learning. And another one yet is integrated knowledge translation. So if there's time, I'm gonna to try to uh, look at three of these today. With respect to PCM team mapping, so as you saw earlier with that team mapping uh, exercise and report, there's new roles, new responsibilities, and electronic tools that could be utilized as part of the uh, 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 PCM methods uh, to do with the team mapping. You have nurse to monitor and triage the PCM results. I mean, in, in a different setting, it may not have to be a nurse, but in, in our study, we found that the nurse was the best position to actually monitor and triage the PCM results. Patients need to complete and review the PCM results, which is something they didn't do before. And also, you need to have the analysts to actually support the friends and support the team on PCM results. And um, there's also the quality improvement cycle that the division actually uh, conducts, and that need to be able to somehow incorporate it into uh, the clinic in terms of the PCMs. And there's team support to tailor the relevant online resources for patients and monitor the PCM data and also follow up with the patients as needed. Because um, all these things don't just happen by themselves. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of um, different steps that need to take place to, to provide specific patients with uh, tailored um, uh, resources, messages, et cetera. Now, some of the issues that you need to consider was that the nurse, from our study at least, seemed to be best suited to monitor the PCM via the portal, but they emphasized that they can only do the work hours. Now, in our case, it was because of resource limitations. You want to expand beyond the work hours, you need to think about that because just because the technology is available 24 hours doesn't mean there's someone at the end constantly watching that. So I think that has to be, um, you know, some real expectations and limitations there you need to be aware of. The clinic had limited capacity for QI and practice change. They're basically at capacity, everybody's overworked and um, there's just no, no room to do anything else. Patients not aware of the nurse and social worker roles. As a result, it was underutilized. Um, because even we moved to team-based care in, you know, in BC, we, we are now moving to these uh, primary care networks. Um, people don't really know what, what, that, what does that mean? And uh, so you need to actually 
socialize the idea in terms of the primary kit networks. And in, in, in the case, if you do have PCM, you need to socialize them. And, and these new roles by the nurses and social workers, they need to be communicated to the patient. And you also need a tailored description of the provider roles because uh, uh, in one clinic, the nurse may have a specific additional role and social worker may have additional roles. Because in our case, we even discuss about trying to provide unemployment information for patients um, from social worker, right? So the patients may not realize that. And so you need to actually tailor the description to, to, the, uh, uh, to these patients, not just a one general brochure because people may not realize, the patient may not realize the, the subtle uh, additional roles that these providers may take on. Now, in terms of shared learning, the patients actually felt validated by completing the PCMs. The PCMs offered checking in with oneself, more confidence to seek support, self-learning, and also allow focusing, identifying priority health issues just by filling out those PCMs. And in fact, one patient said uh, he unexpectedly felt rewarding and validating and it's quintessential learning for doctors and understanding because the doctors actually had to learn about the patient at the same time. And um, so it was quite, quite, um, quite a revealing kind of finding that we, we had. And also multiple PCMs because we have GAD, we have um, a PHQ, and we have these uh, self-care plan, et cetera. It, they offer different insights on the illness and the reason for anxiety, for instance, through filling out uh, the self-care plan, people actually become more self-aware. It is valuable to access tailored online resources. Even though people, uh, patients, um, often they're aware of what's out there, but being able to actually access it, and especially to get tailor it to their particular situation would be very helpful. So that um, uh, bounce back plan was actually quite helpful. And the uh, uh, self-care plan for depression was actually very helpful. Acknowledging issues when put into self-action plan, because by just filling out that action plan, actually help them make them realize it's because once it's on paper, it becomes black and white. They can actually see it and react to it. And if they show it to the provider, they can actually do something about it. Some of the issues to consider: providers have no formal PCM training. They didn't learn about PCM while they're in school, and even in practice, they seldom actually uh, encounter these PCMs. Um, you need to have educational resources for patients and providers on PCM use. They need to be told how to use them. Share problem solving, but need boundaries for desired support. Yes, we want patients to be uh, activated, motivated to uh, engage, to uh, self-care, but there's a boundary. They need to know when to reach out and providers need to, when to um, step in. So uh, those need to be negotiated and sometimes you, you need to have cues to know when to do which. In terms of integrated knowledge translation, uh, like I said earlier, this was an iterative uh, KT process. It was a co-design, implementation, and evaluation of PCM use. And it was iterative. It was iterative adjustments of the, the pathway, the workloads, and the QI to integrate care. So uh, we couldn't have possibly thought of all the different nuances and the details at the beginning. It's only by conducting the study, engaging the um, the participants along the way and uh, building feedback into the process that we were able to refine the interventions and became uh, these uh, PCM methods. And the patient and provider experiences with PCM data and portal use uh, evaluated through individual interviews. So we did do that uh, as part of the KT. So the KT is, doesn't happen at the end uh, because with integrated KT, uh, the feedback process during the whole a study was very much part of the KT design. Issues, well, IKT can address workflow changes and barriers to PCM use. Patients empowered to bring PCM data to visits. Um, but you've got to keep in mind, sometimes they bring it to visit, but they don't get mentioned and that creates disappointment. So um, something to think about. There's a training, modeling and adaptable methods needed for PCM. So the uh, um, IKT allowed us to sort of reflect on these methods and be able to uh, try to uh, bundle them and improve them over time, hopefully. In terms of next steps, well, 
we need to explore the policy and practice implications because this was a, a tiny study, you know, done over uh, a year or so. Um, but there are lots of policy and practice implications, even just the clinic, how do they operate and, and what, what do people do? How should the team function? And how do, how do you incorporate PCM into it? it? Needs to be considered somehow. Replicate the study with more participants when we need to uh, sort of uh, try to uh, replicate the study, enrolling more participants in terms of both patients, uh, clinics and providers to see whether we can um, use the same PCM methods or whether we can refine them. And we also need to validate the methods in different settings. That was for team-based care in primary healthcare setting. Would it work in acute care? Would it work in rehab? And we need to extend to other health conditions. The ones that we did were um, anxiety and depression. Well, what about um, drug addiction? Because we were hoping to look at that as well. What about some of these other chronic conditions? Would they work equally well? And then we need to uh, refine virtual research approaches because this study really forced us to. Um, look at re doing research virtually in a totally different way. I never even left the office myself. And uh, so it, it was kind of a, uh, unreal at times uh, thinking, are we really doing this? It just doesn't feel real. But that's, that's the way that it's happening now. So we really need to, as a researcher, really need to appreciate that and sort of think uh, creatively at, with new ways in terms of conduct, conducting these uh, uh, probably more hybrid form of research. And I think with that, that's the end of the uh, presentation. I'll open it up 